Hello, and welcome to episode four of On Liberty, coming to you live from the Center for Independent Studies in Sydney, Australia. I'm your host, Alvaro Bobonis, and joining me today is James McBrayer, CEO of Cyclopharm, an ASX-listed medical technology company. James will be talking to us today about drug approvals, device approvals, and of course, the coronavirus. James McBrayer, how are you? Yeah, very well. Thank you for having me, Salvatore. All right, well, first, before we even get started, as a CEO leading a listed company in a highly regulated industry, we're going to talk about that in a minute, there are any disclaimers you have to make? Salvatore, we're very transparent. Everything I'm going to say today is on the public record. All right, great. So there's one thing I do want to know about on that public record, something I've been dying to hear about. Tell me about Technigas. <laughs> <laughs> well, Technigas is um, it's a, a fantastic product. It's an Australian innovation. Uh, it was invented about 30 years ago. We're in 59 countries around the world. Um, it's a nuclear medicine lung ventilation imaging agent. It's used primarily to diagnose pulmonary embolism, but with the advent of, of new technology, we're starting to see applications in, in a, a broad range of respiratory conditions. Wait, wait. Tell me that a little more slowly. It is a lung... Lung, a functional lung ventilation imaging agent used in nuclear medicine. All right. So, so what is a functional lung nuclear yeah, imaging agent? Okay. All right. So our product acts like a gas. And you know, there's an old saying in, in the medical world... If you can't breathe, nothing else matters. Well, our products show how oxygen gets into the body. And it does this by producing small particles that act like a gas. And when inhaled, the, the particle technogas goes all throughout the, the lung tree and actually deposits itself in the alveoli where oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange. Right, so right. in now, essence, we show how, how the body intakes oxygen and, and absorbs it. Now, uh, I, I, I'm not a medical person. I'm not a nuclear pharmacist, and we'll get to what a nuclear pharmacist is in a minute. But, yeah. but what are the implications of that for something like coronavirus diagnostics? I mean, I know you can't give medical advice here online. Sure, sure. You know, what, yeah, I'm, what I'm, sort I'm of a pharmacist, not a clinician. And I think I, I, where, where coronavirus, you know, one of the biggest issues, and why you hear so much about respirators, is, is it the fact that the body is not getting oxygen. That it's okay. the, 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 the condition that's uh, caused by the coronavirus is infecting, it's inflaming, and it's closing off the lung's ability to actually take in that oxygen. And that's why the respirators are forcing oxygen into the body. Right. Right. Now, a respirator, of course, is a medical device. Yeah. I'm also familiar with drugs. You know, I take ibuprofen for inflammation, that sort of thing. Technogas? Device? Yeah. Drug? Yes. It's actually both. It's actually both. The, the, the product that, that Technogas is, the small nano-sized particles of radioactive carbon, that's what it is. Okay. Um, so it, like tree dating. Has, sorry? You're tree ring dating people's lungs. Carbon <laughs> radioactive, just like with the trees. Mm, right? Very, no. very, very, very small. Very small dose. Very small, so much so, it's 40 times less radiation than a CT scan of the chest. For breast okay. dust. It's very low radiation for a nuclear medicine procedure. Um, so what these particles, um, what the, the radiopharmaceutical is the technical portion of it, but you need a device to actually create these particles. And we produce in our factory in Australia, in, in just outside of Sydney, uh, what's called a technogas generator. So when we sell to our customers, we sell a generator that's a capital piece of equipment that, that lasts for up to 20 years in some cases. Uh, and then we sell single patient consumables that they, they go about making the Technogas on site. So quite a unique product in that, um, you know, they're actually manufacturing for each individual patient on site at the hospital, the Technogas particles. Now, now, you said you're manufacturing not just in Australia, but in the, in the Sydney metropolitan area. Yeah. I, mean, I thought manufacturing was <laughs> God, I mean, why, why haven't you closed the factory and opened a cafe yet? I mean, what's going on? <laughs> Is it really well, possible to do manufacturing here? Not, not just in Australia. I mean, I understand that you were out in Newcastle or something. You're, you're manufacturing in Sydney? Yeah, yeah. I, I think 
you know, there's a couple of reasons for that, Salvatore. First and, and foremost, um, you know, we want to maintain a presence in, in the Australian market. I mean, that's been our base ever since inception, uh, close to close to 30 years ago. Uh, we've got a very niche product, so we're not talking about huge volumes at the moment. I mean, we have grand plans like every every organization and, and the entry into the U.S. Uh, will be part of those plans. But, you know, we made a very conscious decision a, a number of years ago when we had a, an older facility located not uh, in Lucas Heights, just outside the, the reactor area. Um, when we decided to move, we said, should we go offshore? And, and produce these, these this equipment uh, in you know third third party manufacturing or or set it up in a, in another country. We made the conscious decision. No, we're staying staying in Australia. We're staying in Sydney, right. and we set up a new facility uh, at the end of 2016 that was not only uh, meeting the, our our demands in the 59 countries that we're distributing to today, but it's it's ready for our launch in the U.S. once we get U.S. FDA approval. Well, let me ask you about drug approvals in a minute, but but first, yeah. I, I want to ask about this manufacturing thing, because, of course, yeah. you know, very few people still manufacture in Australia. There are two things that I wonder about. First is, isn't Australia really far from everywhere? I mean, doesn't being in Australia create problems for, for supply chains, for getting things in and, and for distribution? I mean, how does all that work? So, you know, you're quite right. You know, and when you look at, at how our revenue is split, only 15% of it is Australia and New Zealand. Um, you know, really? Yeah, and, you know, even though that we're, we're based here in Australia, you could almost call us a, a European country where 60%, 65% of our revenue is, is European-based. Okay. So how we go about doing that um, is that, you know, our, our business model is based on um, a consumable that's almost like an annuity stream. We, we have very clear understandings of our, our customers' requirements, how the trending is. So we're able to manufacture uh, in Australia. Uh, we have a regular de delivery through sea containers uh, to our distribution office right. in Ireland and the same in Canada. Right. And then getting parts? Uh, I mean, everyone's talking about supply chains collapsing. Yeah. I have my own views on that, which will come out in Foreign Policy Magazine next week, but I I'm curious to actually talk to someone who's in business. Are, are, yeah. Is there any trouble getting parts? I mean, presumably most of your parts don't come locally, right? Well, you know, fortunately for us, we've, we've been planning the U.S. launch for quite some time, okay. and we were way ahead of the curve before this coronavirus hit in the distribution channel. So we had we had already had placed advanced orders into our suppliers. We'd had them ready to go. And we've been doing working with them for the last six months prior to the corona. That being said, uh, we don't rely on a, a lot of, of, of raw materials or componentry uh, from China, at least from the consumable side. From the electronics that go into our generator, sure, there's, there's some issues with that, but we had well in advance of the, the virus outbreak had placed in enough stock to keep us going for at least six months. Right. And the second question I had about manufacturing in Australia is, is what about wages? I, I mean, we, we hear that, you know, Australia is a high wage economy, you know, priced out of the manufacturing sector. How does that work for you in practical business? Mm. You know, from, from, in, from our perspective in, in Cyclofarm, it's not that labor intensive. Um, okay. So we, we are able, uh, we would prefer to have our quality people on site, you know, very close by uh, where we can see the manufacturing, uh, not at a distance, but, but where, you know, the management sits, where their quality sits, and where, um, I guess, the ultimate responsibility is. We don't, out, we don't uh, outsource that responsibility somewhere else. Right. I mean, uh, again, I just want to ask you about this. I don't often get to talk to CEOs yeah. of manufacturing companies. Uh, you know, General Motors pulled out of Australia and yeah. you know, pulled its manufacturing. But we see people like you know Elon Musk is making cars in California, which is the yeah. highest wage, high economy in the world, presumably through automation. Hmm. Is there an automation route to manufacturing for Australia? Well, look, we've we've automated. Um, you know, when you look at the the progression and the evolution of of how we do manufacturing, um, we have automated. Um, we've, we have our own bespoke manufacturing equipment that, you know, we, that used to be handmade. And, and internally, we've, ha we've got our own, own shop fitters and electricians that actually put the equipment together that, that automate the, the manufacturing. So we've done that to a, to a degree already. And what we're planning on doing is, 
and I guess it's highlighted uh, what's happening with the coronavirus, where there's some, so much dependency on overseas manufacturing. Um, right. We always have the plan in longer term to have a secondary manufacturing site. So we can't be reliant. No company should be reliant on, on one site. I uh, think just from being you know, risk adverse, you need to have a, set, a backup. Um, so where is it, it, it talk about the, in the cyclofarm context yeah. where it's not we're not talking about large volumes uh, like cars or but in, in my previous experience when I was manufacturing I was running the, the country's um, largest contract pharmaceutical manufacturer right. there there's some real issues with that and you know when you have your supply chain that so many of the raw materials are coming from China. Um, there, there's risk there. Um, we were at some point, at one point, looking at at manufacturing overseas as well. But in the end, we still stuck with Australia because you can control things far better locally than than remotely. Right now, Gay asked us before we got started about uh, flu vaccines and whether <clears throat> flu vaccines are are going to be held up because of production delays. Now, I know that your business is not flu vaccines, but is that the sort of thing that there would be production problems because of coronavirus, or is it like the flu va- ordinary flu vaccine? We're not talking yeah, about that. Um, you know, if, you, if you're talking specific to flu vaccines, I, I don't think, you know, that's going to be, um, that's necessarily going to be a, a problem from a, a distribution and logistics. And even a, what's been exciting to see, actually, is what has happened over this challenge that the virus has put to the scientific community, it's been amazing. And I've heard one, I think it was a Stanford researcher saying that he's been able to do more in the last three weeks than he has in the last three years because all the bureaucracy has come down. People are focused. Uh, you know, you don't have to go through three or four hands before you get sign off on, on buying a paperclip anymore. So I think that's been the exciting part. And I, I heard last night that, uh, in, in Britain, they've even come up with, you know, possible two different vaccines. So it's okay. it's an amazing challenge to the scientific community, and I, they seem to be responding. Let, uh, and let me pick up on that, because I know that you're applying for FDA approval for Technogas. You said you're in 59 countries, but not yeah. in the United States. So I'm an American. You're an American. At least you used to be. You're I'm still? still? I'm oh, half yeah. and half. I'm going to get double <laughs> cool citizenship. <laughs> and... And so, oh, you must be paying some kind of taxes. But I don't want to, I'm not going to even ask you about that because if I'm paying, I know you're paying. But the uh, but but as an American, you know, we tend to think of the United States as being in the lead of everybody. You know, America's always in, coming first, and oh, 59 countries, but not the United States. What's going on there? Yeah, look, I we're I often describe our, us as the um, the world's smallest multinational. You know, we 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 are we are in so many different countries, and I challenge you know a lot of the big the huge pharma's to be in as many countries as we are. And in doing so, we have to we still have to comply like just like the big guys on how we manufacture and distribute and, and all of the, the, the requirements associated with our product. I have to say that you know yes, fifty nine countries. It was invented in Australia. It was first registered here as a device. Then we went to went to Europe, and then it was registered as a device. And then the Europeans decided, oh no, it's actually more of pharmaceutical. And so we have all of these different um, approaches to regulation throughout the world. Now, if, if if I was comparing, you know, the United States has the FDA, and you know, in some ways, it's an island in a regulatory sense. It respects. The input from other uh, other experiences, but um, you have to tick their boxes. You okay. have to tick each and every one of those boxes. I, I would say, if you were looking at from a European perspective, um, which our country, our, our company is mostly uh, shooting to, Europe seems to have access to drugs faster, and I don't know why that really? is. They seem they seem to be able to uh, on a, on a country basis. Now that that being said. You know, if you make a change to a, a, one of your products in, in in Europe, it takes forever because of the European Union and how that you know you, you throw everything into a committee, and and sometimes it gets through quickly, sometimes it doesn't. But once you're in, the mutual recognition allows you to the speedy entry throughout so, countries. That so you, so you, you you pick on a little easy country like. Slovenia, and then you expand out when you get their approval? How does it work? 
No, well, well, actually, um, you know, if you look at medical devices, and it's, it's actually been highlighted as a problem in the world, um, the way that this mutual recognition has, it, Germany has, has been seen, a lot of the, the companies that if you want to launch a medical device, you go to Germany because it has a, a lower threshold. It has more people that can approve a product for CE mark uh, in, in, in Europe. Most of the, I think uh, two thirds of the products are, are actually first applied for in Germany and then, okay. and then pushed out. Uh, I think you, what you have to do in Europe is that you have to go to a country, you have to say, I want you to be my sponsor, and then it goes out from that country once you get CE mark. Pharmaceuticals are a little different. It's a little okay. higher, higher mark. But the FDA, um, you know, they have had, we're a complex product. We're a device and a drug. We're manufactured on site at the point of administration. Um, it took a little bit of time for the um, for the FDA to understand and actually determine us as a combination device. And, you know, the company itself, we've had our own issues. You know, we, we said, hang on, we're, we're in all these countries. You should just approve us here in the United right. States. Well, there's no fast track that way okay. with the FDA. That's not a good argument. You still have to provide your data. So, so Gay is clapping on the back for uh, Australia first and then going overseas. So <laughs> some people are happy about that. Yeah. Uh, I want to ask you, you mentioned that your regulatory hurdles are coming down because of the coronavirus epidemic. Um, is that very narrow only for yeah. coronavirus? Or like, is there any, are there going to be any lasting lessons? Like if they get a coronavirus vaccine out in six months, are they now going to say, hey, let's, speed things up for everything else? I mean, what's your perspective on this? No, okay. no, 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 I, I, you know, it's funny how, you know, how crisis brings focus. Right. And once the focus, I think, is, is, is been addressed, they're going to, I think, unfortunately, we're going to be reverting back to, and the problem is that, you know, whilst the, the coronavirus, and we're not, we're not part of this from the FDA because it's in the process and they have, they have dates and marks of, when they have to respond to things but um you know we're up for renewal for um you know they've just increased the regulatory framework in europe uh this thing called mdr and that was supposed to come in uh at the beginning of next year and because of all this coronavirus um their people aren't able to go do audits so they've had to extend that an, an extra year so you know there are some flexibilities that are happening but I don't see the regulations coming down. I think they're just picking the can a little further down the road. Yeah, it's, it's always seems funny to me that uh, in times of crisis, uh, you know, when, when millions of people are affected, we're willing to streamline and do things more efficiently. But, you know, if I have a rare disease and I'm the only person in the country who has it, it's still a crisis for me. Uh, I, I mean... Why do you think there's this, you know, is it, is it unique to democracies that we have this, you know, we'll do something about it if a lot, well, think of the, think, think of the uh, changes to uh, Centerlink. Uh, you know, if, if I were unemployed six months ago, I get only, you know, 525 uh, every two weeks. But if I'm unemployed now, I get, you know, 1050 every two weeks. I mean, why do we, why don't we just take the lessons we learn in a crisis and apply them all the time? Well, you know, I, I'm hopeful that we will. You know, I, I'm hopeful that this is an opportunity to kind of do a, a stock take, a, a reset, if you will, on a lot of things, I, not, not just, you know, pharmaceuticals. And we, we're talking about pharmaceuticals. But, um, you know, there's some there's some positive signs coming from the United States. Only last year, um, Trump. Uh, he, you know, he was very big when he when he came into into the office about, you know, for every one regulation, he wants two right. gone. And, and they were applying that um, with... Well, they were actually uh, doing that. With the FDA. The FDA is, is you know, when, when he, uh, Trump first got in, he, uh, he nominated Dr. Scott Gottlieb. Scott Gottlieb was very, very bullish on trying to do these sort of things that had been in concept, that things they wanted to do, but that he, he gave them the impetus to actually get them done. They, they uh, approved in the United States um, right to try, um, as well, so that you could have, and, but other countries have a similar sort of framework like special access schemes. So if a product's not available, you do have access to it. So there, there are little mechanisms around, around the world that allow for that, but not on large scales. 
Now, I, I might ask you to uh, play a tune on the saxophone for a moment while I do my while I do my song and dance, because I've got to do a little <laughs> song and dance and ask people uh, to, of course, please consider subscribing to the YouTube channel. We'd love to get up to 10,000 subscribers. Please do donate to CIS. If you go to cis.org.au, don't forget the .au, uh, you will be able to press one of those two red buttons at the top right of the screen. That's either to become a member or to donate. If you're not a member yet, become a member. I think it's uh, $40 a year for the friendship membership category, and you know that gets you most of the benefits of membership. We'd just like to have you as part of the family. Of course, if you want to donate $50,000, click that red donate button and you'll get uh, a lot of attention. But even if it's $50, if it's $500, if it's $5 million, you know, we'd really like to have those donations, especially because right now you'll notice that we're, we're doing this on YouTube. Well, normally we would be doing this in person and we would be collecting $35, $40 a person uh, for the event. Without that event's revenue, of course, you know, our revenues are suffering right now. We're not in the nuclear medicine industry where everyone needs our products. Uh, you know, we're in the ideas business where it's difficult to get people to pay for ideas, especially at a time like this. Now, if you've lost your job, if you're having financial difficulty, <laughs> don't worry about it. But if you can afford it, please do consider giving a donation at cis.org.au. CIS We'd love to have it. I should point out the CIS accepts no government money, and that includes in this time of coronavirus. That means that we are not taking job keeper allowances. Uh, people at CIS have had to make sacrifices in order for the organization to continue running. Your 40 or $50 will go really directly into the paycheck of someone at CIS who really does need it at this time. We're trying to hold on to staff and keep things together. Now, that's not me. I have a job at the University of Sydney. That's not James. He's got a job. It's the producers. It's the people who are putting this together and making this possible for us. So please do consider making a donation. Now, James, I'm, I'm sorry you couldn't provide some music no, for that. No, no, Salvatore, I'm, 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 I'm not warmed up on my saxophone, but I'll keep singing your tune. I mean, I joined the CIS. You know, you just go to the website, and, and right there on the front page, you see about the mission and the values of the organization, you know, freedom of choice, the individual liberty, um, cultural freedom, and the freedom of exchange of ideas. Those are the things that ring true to me, and that's why I joined. Well, thank you. Thanks for the plug. Uh, what brought you to Australia in the first place? I, I hear your accent is not, well, not kosher, either American or Australian. Well, I, um, I, back in 1996, I was working for an organization in, in the United States. It was a nuclear pharmacy uh, network that wanted to expand internationally. I was a single man. Uh, I was signed up for a three-year three-year deal, single man, three-year plan sort of thing. I met my wife and then my daughter came along. And so, you know, 24 years later, I'm, I'm, I'm still here. So it's a Southern accent that's been <laughs> bastardized over, over a nearly a quarter of a century. Uh, we can still hear it loud and clear. Don't worry about that. Now, we are going to take questions from our audience. We have a nice audience on YouTube today. And uh, if you'd like to ask a question, just put it down there in the comments box on YouTube. Uh, we have a question from Richard. It's not really a question, more a comment about investments, saying that Australia, the U.S. invests far more in Australia than other countries do. Uh, what's the role of U.S. investment in Australia? Do you see a lot of that? I mean, is... is uh, uh, Cyclofarm invested from the U.S.? I mean, what what is the connection between U.S. investment and Australia? How important is that for business? Yeah, look, I, I, I think there's, a, there's a, a number of different reasons. I think, you know, certainly language is, is the obvious the obvious one. Our economies are, are, are very similar. Um, legal system, you know, the rule of law, uh, that, that's important. As well, uh, we're seen as a, as a safe harbor for uh, for investors in that uh, they understand that uh, our, we have a very high governance requirement in in our public companies. So I think from a, a risk perspective, we're we're a safer bet than maybe some of the other countries out there. Um, uh, we we value uh, intellectual property and we defend that. Uh, not so in in a lot of other organizations. We've been uh, getting, I guess, some, some attention given the fact that we are a small uh, med tech uh, listed organization. Uh, we've been listed since about 2006, but I think people have been waiting for our U.S. FDA entrance. And so we've started to get some interest, particularly from 
different funds in the U.S. Uh, wanting to know more about our story, given that we're uh, within a year, I think, of, of being in the U.S. and having some uh, significant growth opportunities there. Right. Do, do Australian companies, and I'm not going to ask you about Cyclopharm in particular, but in, in general, do Australian companies look for U.S. direct investment or do they benefit from U.S. investment into the ASX more broadly in terms of yeah. like index funds? I mean, what, what is the angle on U.S. Australia? For so Australian I think companies? Sal Salvatore, I think one of the things that, you know, I, I, I spend most of my, my time with colleagues in the, the biopharmaceutical med tech uh, industry and you know usually what happens in in that space is that um, it's more developmental um, you know they're trying to work through phase one phase two very rarely do a company does a company like ours go to phase three where you're actually the one going to be taking it through the FDA and on onto market so uh, I think the in, in, in the investment um, is usually more towards like big pharma or big med tech to try to invest in the technology. Um, you're not, we're not seeing so much of foreign investors per se, you know, the big, the big uh, funds management companies coming in because we're typically too small to get their attention. I mean, the companies here in Australia. So now, the investment comes from companies more. Now we have a question from Mike in Pittsburgh and we do have a global reach <laughs> on Liberty. We have a question from Mike in Pittsburgh asking, is there any truth to his Contacts. He has contacts in the Greek Australian community that Chinese investors are seeking new footholds in Australia because they expect to be blackballed. They expect to be excluded from other markets. Sorry, who is that from Pittsburgh? <laughs> Mike from Pittsburgh, former so colleague Mike, of mine. Yeah. Mike, you know, I, I don't think I, I don't think that you can you can pick any one particular country. I mean, the Belt and Road is a is a very open. Uh, policy of China about, you know, trying to, to bring the old Silk Road into the, the 21st century. Um, so I, I think I think it's it's everywhere. Right, right. And uh, let me ask you a personal question. I, I know that, um, you know, for all the younger, well, no, let's be honest, there are no younger people listening to us live right now. For all the older people out there who have children and grandchildren uh, who might be considering careers, What's a nuclear pharmacist, and how do you become one? Um, well, nuclear pharmacy is uh, when I went through nearly thirty years ago. It was one of the it was the first specialty in in the United States for a specialty pharmacist um, because okay. it was seen to have you had to have certain extra qualifications. So um, first, I went on and, and I got a, a pharmacy degree from the University of Georgia, um, and. And during that, that time, I always thought I was going to go into industry, and that was sort of my career path when I went into pharmacy school. But I stumbled um, across a, a, a subspecialty, nuclear. And what nuclear uh, is, is it, it's using radioactive diagnostics, and it's mostly diagnostics, uh, but more and more we're seeing more therapeutic applications. But what it does is um, it's, a, it's a whole different way of understanding how organs are functioning and disease states are functioning. And I was fascinated with it. And it was true compounding because every day it was, um, you'd have to go in and usually at midnight to have 80% of the, the, your manufacturing done before 7 a.m. in the morning to get it to the hospitals and clinics. It was a fascinating production, distribution, logistics. Uh, but the education required me to get um, what's considered to be an authorized user status with the, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission where you're, you're dealing with um, the physics of medicine, uh, how radioactive materials function within the body, um, those sort of applications. So uh, I decided to do that straight out of university. I was lucky enough to get into a management track very, very early. And within six right. years after graduating, I was in Australia. Oh, wow. We, we have Mit Mitchell and Max protesting that at 26 they count as young listeners, <laughs> so maybe they have a future in pharmacy. Uh, Gay and Jan insisting they're run young at heart. I don't think that'll get you a future in pharmacy. But I, I would like to ask you a little more about this nuclear issue. You mentioned that you, as a pharmacist, mm. were dealing with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. They're the people who regulate nuclear power, right? Well, anything, anything that's radioactive, really. So the NRC, okay. um, 
they they set some guidelines on if you were to handle radioactive material in a safe way, you have to be licensed. So I I would have a far, I would in the United States I was um, we were manufacturing under pharmacy law, so I had to have a, a pharmacy license in whatever state I was working in. And depending on the state, I would either have to have uh, a, a radioactive materials license through the EPA. So I would you'd have to be double licensed to ensure that you were qualified to actually manufacture, handle. Um, and manage these facilities that, that had basically radioactive material on, on site and distribute it. Now, who does that in Australia? Obviously, Australia doesn't have nuclear power. So who's regulating nuclear pharmacy in Australia or nuclear materials? Well, there is, you know, it's, it's funny that um, there is a, an organization, ARPANSA, in, in, in Australia, and they regulate basically ANSO. Right. Okay, could you give us those two again? <laughs> our, our, our PANSA is, is uh, it's the government body, of Australian radiation, and I, the, it, it goes on. It goes on. Okay. But um, ANSO is the, is the the government body at Lucas Heights that has the, the, um, the reactor. The, our only nuclear reactor in, in Australia. It's not for power. It's, uh, it, it's mostly badged for uh, medical production, but it also does some other things. It does research. It, it, it also produces uh, you know, silicon chips. It does all sorts of different things that are required. I mean, radiation, you know, people are, are, are saying we're almost a radiation-free zone. You have uh, you know, apparatus that produces radioactive uh, energy like cyclotrons, and that was a business that we were and still are involved in to a degree. Um, there are sources that they use to understand how welds, for example, uh, if a good weld has been made on, on some of these critical uh, plumbing devices. So there's radioactive sources all over. So a Panza, in a broad sense, has ANSO as their main client, but they also regulate uh, other aspects as well through the various states, in, uh, New South Wales, and, and uh, they have the EPA, and they have a department for, for radiation protection as well as every other state in the in the Federation. Now, Jan was asked, was telling us about the Lucas Heights reactor down in the yeah. comments. You mentioned that earlier, Lucas Heights. What, uh, I don't know anything about this. So what, there is a nuclear reactor in Australia and yeah. should there be more? I mean, what's the, what's your own view on nuclear power? Well, I'm a, look, I'm a huge fan. I'm a huge fan of nuclear power. Um, I grew up in the, the Tennessee Valley uh, in Northwest Georgia, where we had, we had nuclear reactors on these pristine, beautiful lakes. Uh, on, and, and, and so, you know, I grew up in the, in the shadow of those. And when our largest, um, our largest customers in, in Europe are French, and greater than 80% of their power is generated okay. through nuclear. So it can be delivered safe and effective. And it is the cleanest energy out there that, that you could possibly, uh, you know, the carbon footprint for uh, producing solar panels and all these wind turbines are far greater right. than, than what nuclear power actually produces. So, but we do have a, a nuclear reactor in, in Australia. We've had it since the 50s. Um, they had a, uh, a, a, the first reactor was, was developed and a new one was recommissioned uh, about uh, 15, 10 to 15 years ago. Right. So it produces uh, an isotope that's very important in, in nuclear medicine. And from a commercial basis, it sells that product throughout the world. It's called molybdenum. And molybdenum is an isotope that's used to, uh, in, in nuclear medicine departments that produces this isotope called technesium, technogas, technesium, technogas. Oh. And that's, that is the isotope that's used in about 85% of all nuclear medicine procedures around the world. ANSTO produces some of that and sells that to producers around the world. We don't do 80% of it from Australia. Don't get me wrong on that. But we, we, we are part of that global supply chain here in Australia. Now, Mitchell is saying that Australia has history on its side when it comes to medical innovations. You know, could Australia be developing more of this? Uh, on the other hand, we do have, uh, if I we have Gay asking us about the waste issue. And I know that even with nuclear medicine, forget nuclear yeah. re nuclear energy, there's a nuclear waste issue. So, you know, what what's the balance on this? Can we be doing more on the nuclear side? And if so, where does the waste go? Right. So, um, the waste uh, for for years and years and years, we've we've been managing it on site at, at Lucas Heights. But um, you know, when you look at at 
the opportunity for Australia uh, from a, a waste management point of view. We tick so many boxes, both on nuclear power and, and nuclear waste management. I mean, we're geologically stable, uh, for one thing. So, uh, you know, we're, de we're dealing in, uh, I think, one of the places that they were trying to put the, um, the, the waste disposal or, or storage was in South Australia, dry. Those are the sort of things that you require uh, in, in securing these things. Um, so, look, I think we tick a lot of boxes, and I think we can't be hypocritical either in that, you know, we're producing the uranium that's being processed right. overseas. So, you know, we can't be we can't take the, the, the good upside of the royalties off of the mining side of things and not have some responsibility for the on, ongoing storage of these things. Right. So Kim is asking us what could be done in Australia to expand the growth of the nuclear medicine business? What's holding it back or is anything well, holding it back? Well, I, I think I think we actually punch above our weight a little bit in, in that in that area. I mean, we've been very uh very good at, at, at embracing this new concept called theragnostics, for example. That's where you're using um, isotopes to target a particular disease state, and we're seeing a lot of it in, say, prostate cancer, for example. Um, then, then using a higher dose of that radiation, knowing that it has an affinity for that disease state to go and, and, and basically eradicate it. So we've been very big in, in driving that. We have a very mature... Um, nuclear medicine, uh, I guess, industry, if you will, uh, the innovation that's come out of Australia is, um, is is very strong in comparison to a lot of countries around the world. And there should be more. Absolutely. And one of the things that I think is important for the government, for example, is to maintain, um, you know, the support of, of research and development. And I, and I think rather than trying to, to, to funnel it into areas where it, it might make a, a nice ribbon cutting ceremony, research development takes a lot of time to mature. And I think that's where I would like to see, you know, uh, even more than what we're doing now. But I think the government with the current program has been, been great. And we've benefited that uh, as well. I mean, from a small company like ours, um, we have an obligation not only because it's, it's good commercially, but we have an obligation to ensure that our product is actually um, living up to its full potential. And whilst historically we've been um, focused on diagnosing blood clots in the lungs, more and more, you know, our, our product is about anything to do with ventilation. And so we're looking at, at applications like asthma. Um, we're doing research and develop in, in COPD. We're looking at, at lung transplants, lung volume reduction. You know, there's so many different applications that we invest in and with support of the government that that will allow us to continue, even though we're a small company, to, to contribute back to society. Right now, we're going to have to wrap up in just a minute or two. Uh, I do want to remind everyone, please subscribe to the YouTube channel and click the bell the updates bell and you'll get updates about you know these broadcasts in the future also please like the video the more people who like the video the more chance it is it'll be shown to other people by youtube's algorithms we'd really appreciate the support also of course if you want to give financial support we'd love to have it go to the cis website you can make a donation there or even better if you're not already a member please do become a member now we do have a, a, a comment i guess not a question but do you have any thoughts about uh, thermonuclear power, ITER in Marseille? Mitchell asks us, you know, any thoughts on that? Look, I, I, I couldn't really comment on, on, on that. I'm not, a, I'm not across that particular thing. Yeah, it wouldn't, wouldn't help with Australia's uh, uranium stockpiles moving thermonuclear. No uranium involved. Uh, look, Kim asks us, a government regulator sounds expensive and someone has to pay for that. Uh, in these times we face where the government will be poor in uh, is uh, I'm sorry in these times when you know government businesses are going to come under pressure because of all the coronavirus response is a voluntary code and self-regulation a better way forward for industry you know what I, I am I'm all about small government however and uh, with a caveat I think you know where, where government is supposed to apply itself is in areas where, the private sector uh, cannot. And and I think, you know, if we're talking on a commercial basis, absolutely, government should stay out of commercial things. I think when the public safety is, is involved, then I think that's where regulation is important. And like anything else, you can overkill anything. 
Um, right. But I, I think with respect to our industry, pharmaceutical industry, I mean, there's, you can point to so many different examples when, when you know, the bar was too low and, and there's been a, an unfortunate consequence to follow on. So I'm, I'm all for uh, regulation that is pragmatic, not, right. not regulation for regulation's sake. Right. And what, what does that mean in practice? I mean, what, what is the balance between what the government has to do and what industry can do? Because, look, let's face it, in the end, we've got to trust people like you that you're doing the right thing. Uh, you know, none of us are going to take apart that machine or take a look. I mean, we have to have a lot of faith in what you're doing. To what extent should we be looking to industry to self-regulate? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. I think, you know, the problem is that you get you get so much conflict of interest. And, right. and you know, and you, you people and we've seen it in I've seen it in, in our industry and, and competitors and, you know, and even. Even in the medical device in industry where the notify even governments have outsourced the requirement through notified bodies, third party, third party providers that, that a, at a company like ours pay to regulate us. It's, oh, really? it's, it's a bizarre situation. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, and you don't know, you know, location, locations. It's, it's, a, it's a complex question and there's no easy answers. I, I think uh, in our particular case where lives are at stake, products are, are you know, uh, are important to understand if someone's going uh, to live or die or how the application of their product will help them to live. Um, I, I have to err on the side of having some regulation from the government rather than self. Right. People right. cut corners. No. <laughs> that's, that's a shame, but it's true, I guess. Look, we're going to have to start wrapping up. We're, really, we're going to wrap up there. I have one final question for you, uh, but you know, I'm going to thank our producers in just a minute and get offline. But I have one final question from, I believe it's from Carolyn, and it's, what do you think of Chinese influence on small Pacific Island states? That's my wife. <laughs> 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 No, she didn't. She didn't actually write in, but I just had to. I couldn't resist. So, so any thoughts about Chinese influence in the Pacific? Yeah, look, um, I, I'd be <laughs> remiss if I didn't have a very strong comeback on that. Uh, I won't hear the end of it if I don't. Look, I think from a from a point of view, I, I think we've been asleep at the wheel. Uh, I think you know when we talk about, and and I think a cautionary note on what's happening uh, with COVID right now. Uh, while the world is focusing in on that, you know, I would I would challenge China's position as being the savior uh, at, right. at, at present, and and I, I think we need to understand, you know, more about the origins and how um, their 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 good graces are being applied even in response to the COVID. So I think it's a cautionary tale, I, uh, certainly. Um, but again, it goes back to almost the first question that we had. It's it's the old, it's a Belt and Road. It's the Belt and Road. Right. It's the right. exploitation of Belt and Road, and and the the, the South China Sea is uh, is their main laneway out of the right. out on the road. Right. All right. Thanks for that, Jen Thank you, James McBrayer, for taking. Your valuable time, certainly much more valuable than mine, on a Thursday morning to come talk to us. I'd like to thank our producer, Max Hawk Weaver, associate producer, Emily Holmes. Thanks for putting us all together. Please, if you'd like to support their work, click that donate button and you know do support the work of the CIS. We'll be back next week with Jacinta Price. So that's a big show. Please be sure to tune in next week. Thanks, everyone, for coming today. Thanks for your questions. And we will see you next week. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Salvador. Thanks, everyone.